Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for being with us uh, and following the series on uh, Greece. This is our second lecture within the series, uh, Greece in the Eye of the Cyclone, held by the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem and the Onassis Program of Hellenic Studies at the University of Haifa. And for the second time, surely not the last one, I wish to thank and uh, Professor Motskin uh, and you, especially Dr. Litmanovic, uh, for this dynamic teamwork we've been conducting for months uh, now. A month ago, at the inaugural lecture here at the Institute, the ambassador of Greece, Mr. Lambridis, <coughs> presented us an impressive overview of Greece at the crossroads in a Europe in transition, in the in endeavor uh, to sort out facts uh, from uh, misconceptions and stressing the root causes, past and present, uh, that led to the current crisis and their particularities. Among other considerations, the, uh, he addressed each of the themes that are going to be explored in the course of the coming lectures, included the social unrest and tendency to radicalization, uh, which is our subject matter uh, this evening. For this second session, I'm therefore extremely pleased to introduce Dr. Maria Alvanu from Thessaloniki, a criminologist and a Supreme Court lawyer, judicially recognized expert. Dr. Alvanu is actively engaged in the academic field of terrorism studies, radicalization, social unrest, and racist slash far-right extremist uh, violence. She has been lecturing at the Greek National Security, National Defense, and Police Officer School. She has also taught asymmetric threats at the Greek Military uh, Academy. Neither is she a newcomer in Israel. A few years ago, she already gave a lecture on contemporary terrorism issues in the EU in the frame of the Onassis um, Program of Hellenic Studies at the University of Haifa, where she comes tomorrow again for another lecture on our current uh, topic. Her doctoral th thesis from the University of Trento, but also under the supervision of the late Professor Menachem Amir at the University of Jerusalem was about Palestinian female suicide bombers. And she later on conducted research on internet incitement to terrorism. Reference to her research is being made by world renowned authors, experts, uh, think tanks and military academies. So she knows what she speaks about. She's a member of uh, the It's Time research team and contributes to the editorial board of various periodicals, notably the European Expert Network on Terrorism Issues. Lately, as an accredited mediator, she looks for effective use of mediation <coughs> principles addressing violence, social unrest due to the economic crisis, religious violence, radicalization, and conflict. This research on the contribution of religion in de-radicalization and peace building has led her to initiate a special collaborator to the Greek online journal Pemtusia of the Maximos Graikos uh, Institute, the project St. Ambrosius, Person and Violence, countering extremist ideology especially right-wing, using the Greek religious and cultural toolkit. This evening, focusing on financial turmoil and social or institutional problems, Dr. Alvanu will investigate for us the subject, which you can see here, extremism, terrorism, social unrest, and grassroots violence in Greece, new forms and challenges for security during the financial crisis. Dr. Alvanu, dear, the floor is yours.
Shalom. <coughs> thank you for uh, the invitation. I would like especially to thank uh, Onassis Foundation, the Van Leer Institute, of course, and Haifa University for this initiative uh, concerning this series uh, about Greece and the situation in my country. Um, it's not, of course, my first time uh, here. Um, as uh, Professor uh, Horowitz mentioned, uh, I was here during my PhD uh, studies. And after, of course, I thank personally Professor Horowitz for the invitation and um, Edu Litvanovic for every facilitation uh, possible for this uh, lecture. I would like to dedicate it to my late Professor Menachem Amir a man who was my mentor in criminology, um, who taught me about uh, terrorism, who taught me about extremism, and uh, who showed me the way a free spirit uh, in scholar field should act. So uh, as I begin, I would like to mention that, uh, of course, my scholar field is terrorism studies, but from a criminological perspective, because usually terrorism is being seen uh, from a sociological point of view, from international relationships. Um, I have the um, aspect of a criminologist, which means that, yes, I do see the social roots, but also I link it to legislation and how uh, a state responds um, to terrorism as a crime. So this is my special view. And uh, in my work, my teaching audience is usually law enforcement. Um, I teach in law enforcement in Greece, also abroad. So I have a more practical view of terrorism because the people that um, I speak to and teach need to know terrorism in practical terms and need to fight it. Uh, so you will not see a very big uh, theoretical agenda by me. I believe that uh, terrorism as a crime should be uh, met with, many, with very practical uh, terms. So you will see, let's say, a practical approach. And um, another thing that I should mention is that uh, terrorism um, is a matter also of public perception. And the public perception of terrorism in Greece is very different than the public perception of terrorism in Israel. And I'm saying this because I'm giving this lecture in a country that is facing and has been facing terrorism for many years. And terrorism here has a special face, its own face, and um, attacks have been indiscriminate. So terrorism is an interest of all of you. Uh, in Greek history, uh, terrorism has different forms. So the public perception, how citizens view the threat of terrorism is very different because the assessment is very different. And this is something that we should have in mind uh, when I speak about uh, the terror situation in Greece. Um, one more thing uh, to say before I begin is that I believe you all know the phrase, one man's terrorist, another man's freedom fighter. And again, terrorism is a field and a notion that uh, a lot of people debate about. A lot of people have different opinions. Um, some people baptize a certain organization as terroristic, others do not accept this uh, definition uh, because everything falls into the category of uh, philosophical debate or political debate whether an action or activity is terroristic or not. Coming from a legal background and the criminological background, what I'm interested in is whether an activity breaks the law and whether uh, the terrorism law can be applied. So when I'm talking about terrorism, I'm actually speaking about Article 187A in Greek Penal Code, um, where this article, uh, which is compatible with the European Convention on Terrorism and the um, United Nations Convention on Terrorism, it actually uh, describes certain offenses, like for example, homicide, arson, when uh, these offenses um, aim to terrorize people and aim to change uh, the policy of a state or international organization. So again, I will not enter the debate, political or philosophical, whether something is terroristic or not. I'm interested whether the law recognizes it as terroristic and whether the state has the right or not to respond to that. So after this uh, forward, I think that I can begin. Uh, 
This presentation seems to link the financial turmoil and um, what is happening in Greece now, but actually the financial turmoil is just a background, is uh, a setting. There is no direct linkage. When we talk about terrorism and terrorist actors, uh, unless we study personally every individual perpetrator, we cannot tell the reason why a certain person perpetrates a certain action. But we can talk about the social setting, the financial setting, that actually fosters uh, his or her behavior. So uh, financial turmoil, social and institutional problems can create the settings from the outbreak of dangerous social unrest that is able also to lead to violent extremism and even political instability in some uh, terms. And it can also create a chaos that could challenge the very institutions of a state. And this is why we care about extremist violence, and this is what we, why we care about terrorism. Um, there is a severe economic crisis in many countries. It's a global phenomenon. And we see that uh, this crisis, in conjunction with institutional problems in several countries, has uh, fostered, as I said, uh, the phenomenon of, of extremism, political violence, and terrorism. We could say that economic despair, in that sense, uh, offers a broad motivation in the sense that it connects people from very different kinds of backgrounds, different kinds of political beliefs, race, class, and it gives them a common ground um, to perpetrate uh, their activities. Um, actually, this type of uh, financial background um, gives us another notion of political history in terrorism because uh, in the old days, terrorism was very much linked to hard political ideology. And the terrorism that we are facing today in, in Greece is another, a new page that, as I said, uh, seems to link the perpetrators uh, in another way that is um, out of the past hard uh, ideology, as we can see. Uh, now, uh, we see terrorism, social unrest, and violence in many countries. And if we are talking about terrorism today in the international community, we mainly speak about jihadist terrorism. Uh, Greece is a different situation. While in most countries we see, as I said, the security problem stemming from the issue of jihadism, uh, in the past it was Al-Qaeda, today is the Islamic State, and though we see also some extremist violence um, occurring because of economic situation and frustration also in the UK, in Italy, in Iceland, I think that the best example and case study to see this new phenomenon of extremism is Greece. Because it is the financial crisis along with indigenous domestic institutional issues that interfere with the political and social life and they are affecting the security and could even affect the stability of a state. Um, the country is facing for about eight years now a deep economic uh, problem and crisis. And at the same time, we see that um, there has been a series of violent out outbreaks and a precedent, I would say, campaign of extremism and terror with special and new characteristics in comparison with the past. The present uh, presentation, lecture, um, highlights issues of mapping and accordingly classifying this extremist violence in the current settings and giving the ideological characteristics that are so special. So uh, let's start with Greece and terrorist groups. First of all, terrorism is not new in Greece. For those who have been following um, what is happening in the country, it suffered in the past terrorism from mainly two organizations. I would mention the 17th November, the Kaiftan Noemvri, and ELA, Epanastatikos Laikos Agonas, a revolutionary uh, popular fight, popular struggle. This would be the... Uh, the English title. Uh, these were the most prominent uh, groups, and the, um, they were uh, operating and active in uh, Greece for many, many years. Um, actually, after the country returned to democracy in 1974, the year that the colonel's uh, dictatorship ended, until the recent past. Now, um, these organizations have been dismantled in the sense that there have been arrests and respective trials, and officially it was declared that um, 
we have we have had an end with terrorism. But on the contrary, we have seen little peace uh, because as early as 2003, we have had new organizations coming uh, into uh, activity, and it came apparent that the war against terror had not finished in Greece. We have had a new scenery of terror. Um, first of all, uh, if we are talking about the new organizations and the new generation and the heirs of 17th November and ERA, uh, one should mention the revolutionary fight, Epanastatikos Agonas, Nuclei of Fire, Pyrenees des Fotias, Sect of Revolutionaries, Sect Epanastaton, and uh, what we would call uh, as small and hit groups in the sense that we have certain groups that don't follow the strict conventional hierarchy that we knew in the old organizations. Sometimes they seem to be offsprings of the previous big or bigger organizations that I mentioned. And they appear for a hit, they disappear, and also security uh, officials have the uh, notion that some of them are the same people who appear, disappear, and reappear under different names. So this is why I call them small hit and run groups. We cannot identify and map them in continuity, but we see trends that show us that probably it's uh, same people um, committing certain acts. Um, Now, uh, the character. In the past, when we were talking about uh, the 17th November and ELA, we had uh, organizations of very strict and certain um, leftist uh, Mao Maoist uh, ideology. In these new organizations, we have more of an anarchist, anti-establishment character. This is the most prominent, I would say, characteristic. Um, Anti-authoritarian, uh, they reject all the political system and all the establishment, all the existing uh, establishment. And um, what, the, what again uh, is, um, I would say, very important is that this new uh, type of ideology affects also the way that they operate. Uh, we have had new elements to the standard operational weapons that we knew in the past. Uh, so we don't have just explosives, small guns, hand grenades that we used to have in the past, and also new ways of attack. Um, for example, um, in the past we could see that the organizations would target very, very specific members of, let's say, the foreign establishment, um, U.S. military rank, politicians, but they would never dare to have an attack that uh, could lead to a discriminate um, number and identity of victims. This is the new page, the new operational page uh, in the terror attacks in Greece. So for example, we have had uh, raids with machine guns against TV stations. Uh, of course, we had personal attacks like bombs mailed to ministers personally, but we have had also uh, bombs left to squares, uh, to metro um, uh, station attacks that we would not see in the past. Of course, now the question would come, uh, okay, we had all this type of operation, did it end to indiscriminate uh, attack and victims? No, because um, part of this operational change has been to show that we have the ability, we have the capability to uh, perpetrate such attacks, but always before putting uh, or planting um, a bomb in such a public place, there have been telephone calls so that uh, the authorities could thwart the attack, um, tell to people to leave, so evacuate the places. So actually this new operational uh, shift was more of uh, a way to say to the authorities, as I said, that we are capable of doing it, but they stopped before actually perpetrating indiscriminate attacks. Uh, my opinion on this is that um, terror organizations, whenever they uh, exist and they are active, they want to enjoy a minimum of oxygen in the place that they perpetrate their violence. And this is something very different when you have uh, terror organizations in uh, separatist organizations or when you have ethnic conflicts. And it's very different when you have organizations 
that act inside a certain state, but they have a political motivation behind them. They don't want to be alienated from the public. If you have an organization of political, of this kind of character, and they perpetrate an attack that has indiscriminate uh, victims, then you alienate from your country. You become um, an enemy for the citizens. They will never back you up. You will never have the oxygen needed for, uh, for survival. Um, and I'm saying this because it's, of course, very different from the attacks that you're facing here in Israel. An organization here can target, of course, the Israeli public because the whole Israeli public is perceived as an enemy and the organizations that are perpetrating terror here don't need, of course, the approval or the oxygen by the Israelis. But it's not the same when we're talking about uh, this kind of organizations. It was the same also in the 70s or the 80s. Uh, if we see Bader Meinhof, if we see Brigade Rose, always the attacks were trying to be inside the limit uh, that would not alienate too much the organization from, uh, from the population. So I think that uh, this is a distinctive um, difference that, yes, uh, there are plans for indiscriminate attacks, yet uh, they are not perpetrated to the full. Also, we have seen copycat uh, phenomenon from operations that take part worldwide. For example, uh, the mailing uh, bombs to embassies was a copycat uh, from Al-Qaeda, but also from uh, Italian organizations. Uh, so we can see that there is an operation, at least uh, cooperation, if I, I may use the word. And uh, this is very important because we see how the know-how of terrorism, because of technology, because of internet, because of globalization of terror, if you want, has entered also the Greek agenda. We would not see this type of attacks in the past. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, the audience and the target group of the organization. Again, this is a big difference that I would like to um, stress. In the past, when someone would read uh, a manifesto of the 17th November or the ELA, unless he was an expert, which means that um, he knew uh, the terminology, um, he had to be someone affiliated with the ideology of the organization to be able to understand the manifesto. Or else he would read something like three, four lines and leave the text. He would not even understand the whole phrasing because uh, the organizations were, had an audience that were the people affiliated to them. On the contrary, today's organization aim as target, as communicational audience, I would say, not target, uh, not the people who share the same ideological background. When they write their manifestos, they don't write it for people who are also anarchists. They don't write them for people who believe the same things. They want to communicate with the average Greek person. The common, everyday people who suffer from the same financial and institutional crisis that everyone is, uh, is facing. Um, I will mention some examples on that because I think that uh, it is quite. If it's here. No. Let me check. No. Okay, so I will mention them because I don't, I don't seem to find the slide now. Um, Um, I will mention to you two attacks uh, that I think their manifestos were very, very um, distinctive on that. One was the attack um, against the administrative court in Athens. Um, the whole text was written in a way that, again, it was not sophisticated, um, hard um, anarchist language, but it was more of coming in touch with the everyday person. The whole manifesto was actually expanded into uh, everyday problems, into the problems that many Greek families have with members of them that um, have been taking drugs and they are in prison. So part, half part of the um, manifesto was dealing with the conditions in prison about people who have been uh, convicted about drugs, how the prison system is inhuman, how people who have had any problems with justice and courts um, are seeing the situation of the Greek um, justice system, and uh, it began with a very common uh, Greek uh, song 
of um, a very popular Greek singer. I don't want to make, um, how to say, I don't want to advertise, so I will... Uh, please do, please do. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, because it was used as, uh, as part of the propaganda. But it is uh, very obvious that it was not, as I say, targeting uh, the past audience of people who would uh, be part of uh, the ideological agenda. And the second one, um, a very, again, prominent uh, attack against um, um, a journalist began with the phrase, Opios eleftera silogate silogate kala. He who uh, thinks freely thinks well. Uh, this phrase belongs to Rigas Ferreos. Uh, Rigas Ferreos is one of um, the minds, I would say, of the Greek revolution against um, the Turks and the regeneration of Greek uh, spirit during um, the revolution against the Turks. And uh, I think that it was quite symbolic in the sense that, again, if uh, one read the whole manifesto and the whole text, uh, it was trying to unite uh, Greeks, mentioning uh, again the misfortunes of the economic crisis, how Greeks suffer, how Greeks have lost their national sovereignty, making um, I would say a symbolic comparison with, with what was happening under the Ottoman occupation, in the sense that at that time it was Ottoman occupation, now it's a financial occupation of the foreigners and of a state that is being imposing very strict financial measures, so people are like um, slaves. And at that point it was the revolution against the Turks, and we have Rigas Ferreos as a symbol and as inspiration, and now we are taking violence in our hands because we are now fighting against this type of occupation. Um, and as I said, these two manifestos are quite um, symbolic and uh, quite important in our analysis of this new page in the form of communication. Actually, it's uh, one of my interests to gather and publish in English and analyze these new uh, manifestos. They have been lots, but I just focused on these two because they are, as I said, I think they are the most important because they were behind two very um, dangerous attacks and again, two very symbolic attacks. Uh, so, um, as I said, um, this is uh, what makes a big difference if we compare uh, with the old uh, manifestos. Um, Now, um, the attacks that I mentioned before were part of um, not conventional terrorism in the sense that I told you that the organizations have changed and there is also a fusion with the hit and run groups and the new kind of operational methodology. But uh, in <coughs> some way, they were part of what we call traditional terrorism. Now, the other uh, part of the attacks and the other part of danger and threat in Greek security uh, has been taking place since the violent outbreaks of 2008. And they are characterized as violent forms of social unrest. It was social unrest that actually ended in violence and extremist activity. And it took forms of violent riots, uh, extremists, enemy and chaos and disobedience to the state and its institutions. It was a phenomenon that started in 2008, as I said. I don't know how many of you um, were familiar with how 2008 violent uh, outbreaks began. Um, it was the symptoms of social unrest resulting in outbreaks of violence that started uh, with the killing of a 15-year-old schoolboy by law enforcement personnel in Exarchia. By the way, Exarchia is an area in Athens um, considered to be the favorite place for some, even the ghetto of anarchists and anti-establishment and anti-authority groups and people. And this killing was the starting point for the expression of strong disapproval and frustration against not only the police, the violent outbreaks that took part in Greece were not just a response to the violence that happened to this young boy, but they were also against the whole set of financial, political, and institutional problems that the country has and had been facing for years. Of course, the trigger, as I said, uh, was the killing of the schoolboy. At first, people went into the street uh, 
to protest the killing of the boy, but uh, even by the slogans that they were used in the initial uh, demonstrations of people, uh, we could see, and it was very evident, that they were referring and protesting about what was going on generally inside the country, about the loss of hope, about the loss of economical stability and ability to actually survive, dream, and prosper um, uh, inside Greece. Um, from a more operational and a practical point of view, uh, it was the first time that we saw the operational um, cooperation through uh, SMS and internet and social networking, in the sense that this violence and these crowds and these mobs were organized through SMS, internet, social network, and this was very difficult for the police to track down and to counter because it was the first time that something like this could, uh, took place, and it was a novelty. Today, of course, uh, national security personnel and law enforcement and everyone takes this as a given, but this was like the first time because everything was arranged and organized in real time through technology and uh, this was a novelty and it didn't take part just in Athens it took part in many cities throughout the countries that were burned vandalized uh, property was looted or destroyed and the safety of people was compromised there were people who could not exit their homes walk around freely or go to their work there were symbols of the state attacked and Greeks were suffering from terror and uncertainty. Uh, actually, I want to share with you a thought that I was making um, when this period uh, was taking place. Usually when we talk about terrorism, we have in our minds certain organizations perpetrating attack. <clears throat> and this is terror, and this is terrorism. But actually, terrorism and terrorizing, and if we remember what happened after the French Revolution and historically, is actually the terrorization of people, and it doesn't have to be linked with a special attack. This part, this chronological period in Greece, was actually a period of terrorism because people were terrorized. Because at the end of the day, terrorism is exactly this, creating to people a feeling of instability, a feeling of insecurity, of physical injury, of injury of property, of losing property, of your property being uh, destroyed. And this is exactly terror. So uh, despite the fact that many theoretics were quite hesitant to use the word terrorism, because as I said, usually it's linked to a specific organization with a specific target, with an attack. Actually, if we leave the legal definition aside and we talk linguistics, we talk terrorism, tromokratia as we say it in Greece, kratos to tromu, which means that terror has power, that terror reigns. This period, I think, is a very good example. And what was more uh, even dangerous was that the violence did not take exactly the form of the strategic and organized hits of these form groups with organized terror, as I said. It was the alarming phenomenon of mobs, of people taking advantage of the whole chaos created to express their individual anger, rage, frustration, and sometimes even inner violence that can stem from other reasons. We could see in our TVs and we could see for those of us who did field work uh, during uh, this type of violence, that there were people who would attack and loot and destroy property without any uh, ideological background, but just because they had the opportunity to destroy, because they had the opportunity to loot. Uh, this whole atmosphere gave the opportunity to people to um, become extrovert with their violence and again to uh, use extreme ways to express it. There were attempts also to enter and occupy the parliaments, as well as actions of aggression against members of the political arena. We have seen and witnessed even the brutal beating of politicians, which is something that shows that people were against the political establishment and they could not contain their frustration inside uh, the democratic um, ways that happens to other countries with political criticism, even fears. We had, uh, as I said, even cases that this extremist uh, extremism took uh, part as brutal beating, as physical injury of politicians. 
uh, there seemed to be no clear cut, no hardcore political ideology behind this kind of violence. Because again, it was more of a general approach of rejecting the political establishment as a whole, the whole political situation and institution as a whole, because they were viewed as responsible for the financial crisis. So again, this type of violence is, it was a novelty because in the previous situation that I mentioned of 17th November, of ELA, of the traditional uh, fight against the establishment, there was a clear-cut ideology. And especially in the 70s and the 80s, all organizations had clear ideology. It was time also of crisis and conflict between ideologists, so people were very much having their own strict ideological path. But today, and after uh, the political changes in history have taken place, hard political ideology does not exist so much. And definitely it did not exist in what happened in 2008 and to the whole era of terror that uh, started. Uh, when I talk with the law enforcement uh, students, we are talking about a page that started in 2008 and never closed. To be true, yes, we don't have the violence in that measure that was perpetrated in 2008. Thank God that we don't, because no one could survive such a violence uh, in more period that, than it did. Uh, but it's not a page that has closed, because it started a tactic, it started an operational way, that we see that it's still um, ongoing. Um, Another aspect of this uh, violence is the neo-Nazi violence. Here, the economic and institutional social problems were very much perceived and linked with immigration, both legal and illegal, and the power of foreigners, especially for some of them Germans. Now, uh, why I use and I classify also this under extremism in Greece? Because apart from uh, the page that we saw before with the anarchists and with um, anti-establishment, we also have groups like that operating in Greece. And the common denominator in, the, in their manifestos, in, in their rhetoric, is the economic and institutional and social problems. Of course, they view them from completely different points of view, but still, they have common uh, ground. And sometimes I do this experiment in my school. Um, I give to the students uh, manifestos or parts of rhetoric, because now you know they have social pages and in, uh, internet and they post and everything. And sometimes I don't tell them which group it is and from what orientation. And you see how confusing it is from uh, the students to understand uh, the organization that it is coming from, because sometimes the rhetoric is quite common. So uh, yes, there is uh, uh, this point, and it is uh, the, mainly it is the economic and the institutional and social problems. And for me, there is also a great paradox in this kind of rhetoric and in this kind of uh, ideology backing the violence. Because on one hand, uh, these neo-Nazi um, groups of people uh, present ideas of Greek greatness. Points of reference, usually the antiquity, patriotic ideas, nationalism. But at the same time, you know, they share this German type of uh, Nazi ideas, symbols, greetings. They have all these theories about the subhumans that are the foreigners and of the clean uh, Greek blood. And obviously, we have an ideological confusion behind these groups. Because uh, for those who know history, they understand that you cannot be a great Greek patriot and a Nazi lover too. In a country that has played one of the, uh, paid one of the highest toll during the Second Ho uh, World War. And it is a bit incompatible um, to speak about your own greatness, to speak about your own uh, history and patriotism, and at the same time, as I say, to imitate uh, Nazi ideas when the whole Nazi regime was against the Greek state and patriots during the Second World War um, fought against uh, the Nazis. Uh, operationally, usually we see this type of violence more um, specific targeted. We see uh, attacks against immigrants 
And of course, people attacks against people who show tolerance and they have more modern um, ideas. Um, we have seen fact type attacks, again, I'm speaking from an operational point of view, and small criminal groups operating. Um, there have been trials and there have been uh, cases that have been brought to justice about this uh, situation. And uh, in certain cases, um, it remains to be seen whether there is a deeper political uh, meaning and ideology behind these attacks. Um, here, I have to mention that uh, there have been accusations uh, against a certain political party in Greece that has been um, viewed as um, supporting this type of attacks. Uh, I will not comment on that because um, I respect the presumption of innocence and since the cases are ongoing in the Greek courts, I don't want to um, mention anything more on that. Uh, we will see what the result of the Greek justice will be and then I think we could analyze in more uh, responsible way uh, the whole situation. Now, what are the problems of this situation for the police and for the law enforcement? Uh, first of all, I must say that, um, you know, some people don't want to link uh, the economic situation with terror and extremism. Uh, because terror and extremism, is, um, they are very difficult notions and they have also political effects. Uh, so it's not just a social analysis, it's a political analysis that uh, has effect also to the whole political situation in the country. But we have to admit that terrorism and extremism are not born in a vacuum. So the crisis does affect the whole situation. It creates a fertile ground. Um, and from that point of view, yes, we can find uh, many ways um, to say how this situation affects every individual. But we cannot close our eyes and say that uh, it has nothing to do with extremism. And also, ideologies are not born into a vacuum, and the crisis against, uh, again uh, affects them. And we see that this fusion of ideology, this um, type of anti-authority, anti-establishment ideology that has its core in the financial difficulties, actually it is uh, a child of the economic crisis. It is a... Uh, an era that has brought distrust, distrust to classic ideologies because classic political ideologies have been uh, failing in Greece, obviously, to take Greece out of the problem. So this also adds to the whole situation. And um, all this fusion, as I said, is very problematic for the law enforcement because ideologies create limits, also operational limits. In the past, um, law enforcement could know behind the ideology of a group <laughs> approximately what kind of terror it could perpetrate. So they knew what to expect. So if you know what you expect, probably you're not 100% uh, successful, but at least you know how to move uh, to counter the activities. Uh, because as I said, ideology creates limits, borders, scope of violence, and it can be more predictable. But uh, with the today's situation, usually the authorities are always one step behind this new situation uh, of the new initiatives and innovations of the groups, the violent groups, because they have this loose, unclear ideology. Um, anything can go. And if anything can go, it is very hard to prevent it and it is very hard to tackle it. I remember a period when uh, talking with Greek officials um, there were threats uh, about attacks, and as I said, attacks that could have indiscriminate uh, attacks uh, very, very often, uh, even on a weekly basis. And even if all those attacks did not take place, and as I said, even those that took place, um, usually the groups, always the groups, would phone and take measures so that there would be evacuations. At the end of the day, all this brought... Uh, and instability, and of course, uh, it disrupted the, the way that the state could, uh, could work. Um, it is a challenge, and it is a challenge because actually, from the point of view of um, Greek police, um, the way to combat the phenomenon has been with operations to arrest members, and of course, to taking the whole judicial uh, road. 
trials convicting um, the perpetrators. Uh, but actually, uh, I think that some of the measures that have been taken and some of the um, activity that could be characterized and maybe is an excessive uh, an excess response and the very severe and strict tactics could act provocatively and because also terror and extremism are games of uh, communication i think that also some of the communicative ways uh, of uh, the greek state to combat uh, terrorism uh, were not very very successful for example I believe that you should never say uh, we won the war against terrorism. The minute you give such a statement, you're throwing uh, the glove someone to pick it up because the organization and the people who are on the other side want to unite and act in order to prove that they are still here and that there is still a war going on. So I think that sometimes there are some small details in the communicational way to address this kind of violence that were not very, very successful. Also, um, we have to see reality. Uh, yes, practically, you have to have situational prevention measures, as we call them, which means that the police has to have operations to deter or even prevent an attack. It goes without saying. At the end of the day, this is the work of the police. But fighting extremism is not just uh, work for the police. It is also work for the political institution. The political institutions have to uh, make ways, have to think of ways in order to better the situation. Unless this takes place, uh, I don't think that we can go further with this situation because all the time we will have uh, new groups appearing and we will not be able to stop the phenomenon. Now, let's be realistic. We can never, and I'm not saying that because I said before that we should not make the statement, I'm saying think realistically as a criminologist. Uh, like with every crime, we can never beat terrorism. There will always be some people who will choose the extremist ways to react against the establishment, against the state. There will always be people who will have complaints and they will choose violence as a way. By the way, having complaints is not a bad thing. Uh, being critical against the government is not a bad thing. Social unrest per se is not a bad thing because social unrest, if it, if it doesn't take a violent form, is a way to show your dismay and it's something that it, it should be allowed in a democratic state. So I begin with saying that war against terror generally cannot be won, but when I say about institutional initiatives to better the situation, I'm, my meaning is that we can confine the phenomenon to those few fanatics that always will pick extremism as a way. The situation as it is today, just taking operational measures is not bettering the situation and it's not confining the whole um, pool of people who are or could be recruited and also people who are, and this is a very sensitive uh, point, but I have to make it, people who are either sympathizers or tolerant. And in this phenomenon in Greece, I think uh, a very important uh, underlying should be this, that uh, I see, at least it is my perception and my analysis from my research, and when I write scholarly, I mention it, that there seems to be some kind of tolerance from a certain part of the public. Because again, as I said, the manifestos and the whole rationale is not something strange to them. They speak to them about problems that they also face. It's not, as I mentioned, the ideology of the 17th November or the ELA. You know, a person in the past uh, in Greece would not, as I say, relate to those organizations. But in some of these manifestos, people can relate, again, Many times I make the, um, uh, let's say, exercise or experiment of giving text without title. And the audience doesn't understand that it's manifesto. They feel that it's something that someone who is just against the whole establishment and the situation, and rightly so, has written. 
And this, I think, is the most uh, dangerous thing. And this is what the authorities, the authorities should uh, work against. Um, as I said, it's a tough and uh, difficult road. It will not eradicate terrorism. It will not eradicate extremism. But I feel that we can confine it into those who will always be extremists, who will always be a threat, but a small threat that a state can contain. Um, I think I should finish here, and um, I'm waiting for your questions. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for this exciting, thought-provoking uh, lecture. Thank you also for reminding us, not only in Israel, uh, but uh, in uh, many other places, just to quote France, for example, uh, in the last time, that terrorism is, uh, to, to remind us, in fact, the wider and historical sense of uh, the term uh, terrorism, which we tend to forget because, of course, again, not only in Israel, just to remind you, 13th of November in, in, in Paris, uh, the attacks, we forget that terrorism was also uh, in uh, 1792 in France, another kind of, uh, I, the idea in fact Terror. that you, so uh, that is a very thought provoking question. I imagine that there will be uh, also um, questions or uh, ideas about that. And I have another question also, but I leave the audience, so please. Uh, Should I take my place yeah. there, or you No, no, you are welcome. Okay. Uh, oh, either you wanted to, no, no. Yvette? Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Yvette Messinas. I'm Greek and I live in Jerusalem. And I wanted to ask you whether you have any tips for Israelis when it comes to what we are facing these days, uh, when it comes to the attacks of civilians, and whether you have any ideas as to how these could be contained or... Yeah. Ah, very nice question with very difficult answers. I believe that if it was so easy, um, Israelis would have already thought about it because they are very clever people. So I believe they would have thought it before me. Um, it troubles me a lot because, uh, first of all, I see the shift from the Second Intifada to, I think this could be, we could name it, not officially, but we could name it the type of Intifada, from the suicide attacks to the stabbing. Uh, operation. Uh, for me, this shows, first of all, that suicide operations were a strategic option, and now that is out of fashion, they have employed a new one. Um, practically, tips, um, you know, it's a kind of attack that it's so personal and so easily to take place that it is very hard to counter. And here I must mention something else. Israel is a test field. Any European that says, I don't care what happens in Israel, lives in another universe. Suicide attacks started here. OK, many years ago, but they started here. Now we see them in Europe. Stabbing attacks. If you remember, I think it was two months ago, we had kind of a stabbing attack uh, in London. There was a perpetrator who had a knife and uh, did this kind of attack. I don't know if we will see it very soon in Europe. But here in Israel, it's the trends. If it works here, the organizations take it and uh, spread it. Um, I think very good intelligence, at the end of the day, if you are talking about the stabbing attacks, very good intelligence, if you can catch the whole situation way before it started, it starts. Once you have a perpetrator with a knife and an access inside Israel, then you know it is a matter whether you have uh, police there, whether they can target and stop the attack, whether they can shoot the, the attacker. This is a matter of, um, of minutes. Now, um, we have to see the broader, the broader picture. Uh, these attacks are part of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So I think, and this is a very sensitive issue because I'm someone outside Israel, but I think that um, ways of coexistence must be promoted. 
And I believe that there is a big problem um, of those people that are fanatics who cannot uh, stand the idea that Israel exists as a state. And this is the biggest threat. So if you're asking me what ways, as I told you, practically very few, unless you have very good intelligence to stop a person before he enters Israel, in the broader picture, um, a form, form of measures to ease the radicalization in the other side. Because if you have persons who don't agree with the existence of Israel, um, you know, you will always have terror. Now, I understand that uh, there is also frustration from the other side, and there are people who face um, certain uh, conditions that foster the phenomenon. One must say this, but um, I think that an eye for an eye will uh, leave the whole world blind. So I cannot justify this type of attacks in any way. Another question, please? <clears throat> Just a minute. I'm sorry I could not be more practical, but... If, we, if you could, you would solve the problem. <laughs> Uh, I have a few things. Uh, one is, uh, in Israel, uh, many people remember that for many years, uh, the perception was that the majority of the population of Greece were very, very sympathetic to what they considered to be the, uh, the Palestine uh, freedom fighters those that were involved in what the Israelis call the massacre in, in, uh, in the Olympics in, in, in Munich and, um, and all the various um, hijacking, that uh, airplane uh, hijacking that, 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 that took place. So uh, this was something which left a very, very bad feeling among, among many, 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 many Israelis. Uh, uh, many also uh, still remember that the, your current prime minister, who's now coming closer to Israel because of various economic um, problems, uh, feeling that Israel can maybe be of a help, um, when he was in the opposition, he played a, diff a completely different, uh, different uh, uh, tune. Uh, we do believe that um, Israel can maybe, with its varied uh, uh, history and uh, and uh, experience can be of uh, invaluable uh, help to, to, uh, to Greece in solving various forms of, um, of, ter of, ter of terrorism, including economic ter terrorism. And we talk about economic terrorism. What is your opinion on what's called the BDS, which is a, a very, very important um, uh, uh, thing that's going on right now and Israelis are very much, uh, very much cons cons uh, concer cons concer concerned about that. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, of course, you must know that there is, and I think it has been going, going on for many years, a cooperation also of um, providing this Israeli expertise of your law enforcement into other countries, among them also Greece, uh, regarding the um, war against terror, because you are the experts here. Uh, so I know that there is a collaboration on that, uh, and I think that this will uh, continue. Um, so I'm sure that, of course, Israel can help, but we must keep in mind that it is a very, kind, a very different kind of terrorism, so measures that can be applied here cannot be applied in Greece. For example, the security fence that statistically has been shown to lower the phenomenon of suicide attacks and has been uh, praised in Israel as uh, something uh, positive, of course, could not take place in Greece because it's a different kind of, uh, of uh, extremism. So, you know, um, just importing Israeli expertise without customizing it to Greek needs uh, is something that cannot work. On the second part of your question, uh, personally, I'm against any bias that is against uh, Israel. So any measure or policy of uh, foreign countries, European Union, that is targeting uh, Israel and is not allowing it to um, uphold its security, 
um, for me is, um, is negative, I don't support it. But I cannot say anything as part or representative of the Greek state or of the current prime minister and the current policy of Greece. I'm not responsible for it. So. Now, you have spoken nicely about this group terrorism or individual terrorism which is understandable, you see, very much. But is there any state terrorism, maybe internationally, or in Greece, or here, or internationally? What are the limits, you see? You know, again, uh, of course, if we start discussing about uh, terrorism from the point of view of the state against citizens, or generally, you know, we find, first of all, there are states who promote or finance terrorism in other states, that conventional type of terrorism. We don't need to name the states. We all know them. Uh, you know, we should not point fingers, but, you know, they exist. And then there are states that have uh, very harsh policies and they terrorize people. This is another kind of state terrorism. And then there will be some people, when I discuss with them, and they say to me that, you know, very strict financial measures, austerity measures that are against our survival instinct at the end of the, of the day, are again a form of terrorism. So um, this notion of terrorism is quite vast. And if we start talking on this level, um, it is a very interesting, of course, um, conversation. But, um, you know, it cannot bring us to an end in the sense that Yes, all this phenomenon exists, but when we lawyers or criminologists want to talk about terrorism, we confine a bit the phenomenon, you know, to the attacks and to this kind of violence. But you are right. Any violence that terrorizes people is terroristic, and it can happen also from states. Uh, it is a bit dangerous, of course, to acknowledge this in the sense that, you know, if someone is terrorizing you, it, it means that you have the right to defend. And then a new discussion begins. What are your limits in defense? How can you defend? Do you defend just through the democratic way and the political system? Someone who believes in law like me will say, yes, if you feel like the state is doing something wrong and it's suffocating you, it can happen. Use the methods that you have inside the political system. Another person could say to you, yes, but maybe the political system offers no ways and it's a dead end and then maybe I could use violence. So it is a slippery slope of a discussion. I try, usually when they ask me about this type of question, which is, which is a very good, and it is a legitimate point, um, I try to say, let's view terrorism as it is prescribed by law. Let's try to face this phenomenon, um, because the other that you mentioned is vast, and anything goes inside. Usually in hard times, most people go to the extreme right. How did it happen, uh, for instance, uh, just uh, Italy in the 20s, Hungary today, and uh, many others? Uh, it's very rare that people uh, choose the extreme left. How did it happen in Greece that it happened? Uh, and today is the mild, uh, mild left. What do you mean? How did it happen? Uh, How did it happen in Greece that uh, not as, as uh, commonly, not as in most of the world, that the, the Greeks uh, choose the extreme left to, uh, to, solve, uh, to rescue them from the crisis? You mean in terms of people choosing uh, extremist violence, or you no, mean... Not violence. It's, it's as a government. First of all, I, uh, but it's very rare. Well, um, I would not call uh, this government extreme left. No, not now, but when it, uh, first he was elected, he was from the extreme left. I would not say that. It is, um, it's, I can understand your political estimation, but it's not mine. Uh, 
I would say that generally, politically, you're right that there is a rise in far right in other states. There has been a rise in far right also in Greece. And I would say that the Greek political uh, platform today, uh, the governmental platform, I would not uh, recognize them as extremists. So, And it's not my thing, by the way, political... Uh, um, how to call it? Uh, yeah. Before you, mind. One of you is going to speak anyway. So. And just to, to say to you something: sometimes when people vote parties, they don't vote it because of because they are affiliated to the ideology always and to all aspects of the ideology. But sometimes, you know, people vote also. Uh, in a way to react to a previous situation. So if someone votes a specific party, it doesn't mean that they are part of that party or that they envisage its own ideology. But I will stick to, the, to my opinion that it's not an extremist uh, leftist. Uh, no. no way. In 2014 it was. No. By whom? According to whom? According to the media. I, I don't live in Greece, but to the media it was the, the most... Uh, from the extreme left, Tsipras, and uh, there was Papandreou from the middle, and there was an extreme I, I'm, I'm not taking a political sides here, and I'm not going to tell you what I voted or what I vote, but I will just say that um, I don't remember the political fight f uh, from these parties that you mentioned, none of them holding an extreme ideologist agenda. And again, of course, you are free to have your opinion. This is how I see it, but uh, I don't remember uh, such a political debate that was uh, extreme leftist. But again, we will blame the media who gave us this idea. Please. And also, you know, the word in Greek, it can be a bit confusing because um, radicalized. Some words in English have very different uh, connotation than in Greek. If you're referring to the name of the party. Yes, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for pres your presentation, but I want to ask you something. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that you have not mentioned the issue of religious terrorism. Now, uh, this is something that we do suffer here from both sides, both Jewish terrorism and Muslim terrorism on one hand. And you suffer from religious terrorism at least in it or, or, or Four countries in Europe have already suffered from it. That is to say, Britain and France and Belgium and Spain. Okay, there it was imported uh, religious uh, terrorism. Now, uh, I think that you have not mentioned it for good reason, because you do not suffer, as much as I know, from religious terrorism in Greece. But as an expert on, on, on terrorism, could you, could you elaborate a bit? Uh, because this makes quite a difference between terror here and terror in other places and terror in Greece and in other places. A very good question. It was actually inside my notes, but I also always get distracted when I have a PPT, so I didn't mention it. Uh, I'm one of those who introduced the notion of secular radicalization, because you in Europe and inside all this jihadi terrorism that we see, we have religious radicalization. And as you say, there is religious terrorism. Here in Israel, it has a different kind of uh, character, but we see it also in, uh, in Europe. And mainly, as I said, it's jihadist. Uh, what we see in Greece is secular radicalization in the sense that what role religion plays in this secular radicalization is the whole financial and institutional situation that plays the role. Uh, my opinion is that in Europe and generally in the West, for too long, because we have secular states, we put religion aside and we, don't, we did not pay attention, we didn't even want to see that it can actually play a role in people's lives. If you'd talked to a criminologist before the attack in, the, uh, in New York, the September 11th attack, and you talked about religion, you would be singled out as someone who doesn't uh, know what he speaks because religion was out of the agenda. Then. The, 11, uh, the September 11 attack came and we saw that people actually can perpetrate in modern times terror because of religion. But again, uh, the secular scholars tried to explain this with economic terms and um, other social theories, which 
by the way, you know, they explain part of the phenomenon, but also we have to have our eyes open and realize that religion can mobilize people. It can mobilize them to violence, and if we are clever enough and we can uh, use and make good use of the good qualities inside religion, it can mo motivate them also for coexistence and for peace. So yes, today, for me also, the religious aspect of uh, terror is the most important. Uh, I think that France, by the way, if I may say so, is a very good example of, and I love France, but I believe that in its policy, it was blind to religion. It had the notion of, we don't recognize it, so it doesn't exist. So we don't allow kippah, we don't allow the scarf, we don't allow any religious um, manifestation. And we think and we hope that nothing happens underground. We could not be more, they could not be more wrong. And actually, unless you give space to moderate forms of religion and manifestation, extremists will have fertile ground to actually carry their own agenda. So for me, yes, religion is number one, but you see states like Greece, where nowadays we don't have this phenomenon, it's also equally serious, um, as I say, the secular radicalization. Of course, the attacks and the methodology are different. I don't believe that any of these groups that I mentioned in Greece could carry or would carry out an attack like in France. It's out of the logic. So yes, religious groups pose an extra threat also because of their capability to sacrifice people and you know, victimize people because they see them as a large part of, uh, of enemy without any other distinction. You're an infidel or even you become a shahid on your own by the attack, so it has no limits. Um. My name is Avi. I would like to ask, uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, lecture. I would like to ask, uh, do you have an, uh, any estimate of how many uh, people from the asylum seeking passing through Greece are staying in Greece? What are the problems ar around it? Are they absorbed in the population? Because, you know, we have some, we had an influx of a few hundred thousand people from uh, Africa. And mm -hmm. What is your stand on it? It is different kind of refugee uh, situation because in Greece, what we face today is the um, refugee influx actually mainly from the war in Syria. <coughs> they don't want to stay. First of all, they don't want to stay. They want to continue their trip in, uh, in the rest of Europe, mainly in the north, in the north sides of uh, Europe because of the economical situation also of the country. Uh, the issue is whether uh, at the end they will stay in Greece and not go there because of several measures that could be taken by the European Union. So this is something that I cannot answer yet because it's something in development. Um, the problems are many and I will not mention to you the obvious that among the refugees could be some people who are jihadists. I'm not saying, and I want to be careful, that refugees are jihadists. I'm not saying this. I'm saying that some jihadists could hide. But there is also another problem for security post. And we have seen this uh, in some Greek islands, that part of the Greek population could show violence and perpetrate violence against them. Um, I remember a case in an island where there was um, something like explosive material thrown uh, to... Uh, groups of, of, of immigrants, and this is also violence. This is also extremist. I mean, we have to pay attention on that. And you know, this kind of violence or counter violence in the sense that people afraid refugees, they are afraid of jihadists and they perpetrate violence because in their mind they are defending uh, Greek security in their own way. This is also a danger. So things are not... Um, so easy, and I think that the threat is not only focused, as I said, to the refugees. Uh, we must not stop being humanists, and there is a refugee crisis, and there is a humanistic crisis. Um, I think that also Greece is um, blamed a bit uh, without reason in the sense that it is very difficult to control all these crowds of people. It is very difficult to make uh, checks. This is a very big influx. Um, so, you know, when you are dealing with so many people, there are bound um, 
mistakes to, to be happen. So you could have jihadists enter. And the problem is that if they enter via Greece, the rest of Europe and having attack there, you imagine the impact that this could have to the Greek uh, <coughs> public image. Ido, can you bring just a minute? Mm -hmm. You wanted sir, to speak. <coughs> Well, well, I have uh, basically two questions, but I think they are perhaps related. Uh, first of all, or oh, two observations, which may be, but, but there's partly observation, partly question. <coughs> uh, first of all, uh, if we look at the Greek economic crisis, it's of course not something that, it's not something of the last decade or, or so, but rather it has a long history, I would say, from the foundation of the, the, the modern Greek state. I mean, the modern Greek state was born with big debts to, to banks in London and Paris, and even the first decades of, of the state, I mean, there was a situation rather like today, with the donors uh, insisting upon government change, uh, you know, uh, uh, economies in, in the government and so on. In, in a sense, so in a sense, the Greek, the Greek economic crisis is uh, uh, has, has very, very deep roots in, in the history of the, of, of the modern Greek state, uh, and so uh, I wonder whether the, the particular kinds of terrorism which you have in Greece also have uh, uh, somewhat have, have roots which are peculiar to Greece. I mean, uh, for example, uh, if as I, I remember the. In the uh, Greek War of Independence in the 1820s, many of the, the, the soldiers were in fact former brigands. I mean, they had been brigands under the, <coughs> under the Turkish regime, partly because there, there were very few... Uh, the, the Turkish regime w was such that uh, they were not that... It's not easy to earn an, uh, uh, an honest living anyway. But of course, after the foundation of the state, uh, the fact, that, I mean, these, it, the next problem was, of course, what to do with the brigands when they go back to, to brigandy, so to speak. So uh, my first question is, is there something in the, 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 the history of the modern Greek state which contributes to the particular forms of terrorism that you have? Uh, and the second question, which I think is related to it, can, uh, it relates to education. Uh, I think any any state, the education system um, <coughs> plays a role uh, also in, in, in deviant behavior. I mean, we know in, in the Palestinian authority, the education system very much glorifies uh, so-called uh, shuhada and so on. Uh, and. Um, so uh, I wonder also, uh, and in uh, even and also with the Jewish terrorists that we've had in, in recent times, we can see that it relates to to certain ways of looking at uh, non-Jews and and uh, or <coughs> and education, looking at Jewish history of combating with other peoples and so on. Uh, so I wonder whether in the Greek education system. Uh, there have been tendencies which uh, maybe not noticed or maybe not intended uh, can create uh, the kind of mentality or can encourage uh, the, the kind of mentality which you have in, in the Greek terrorists. Uh, so these two questions, I think, go together. Be excuse me, just a minute. Sure. Before uh, you answer, Maria, which is totally... Uh, your uh, answer. I want to uh, um, attract your attention that our next lecture mm -hmm. in March, mm -hmm. which I invite you uh, to, will deal exactly with the problem of education. Mm -hmm. So you are invited to come and well, ask your question again mm -hmm. from, from another point of view, probably. Uh, you are very right about the issue of uh, precedent financial difficulties in Greece and um, actually tomorrow in Haifa part of my lecture will be the Metaxas era and how this era was after exactly the whole uh, uh, again very deep financial crisis in Greece and uh, as you say and you're right it's not the first time but you know something um, ages evolve and they evolve very quickly and I don't think we can compare very easily the situation in the sense that Greek people 
enjoy it a very, very good, can I use even the word luxurious type of life for many years, 80s and 90s. Uh, and luxurious type, not for the few, but for the many, for the average Greek person. I mean, the average Greek person lived in a way that if I could make a comparison, I would say he lived better than the rest of Europeans. I mean, he enjoyed a way of life and some, how to say, um, privileges in his everyday life that the average European did not. So this economic crisis uh, came very, in a way, to abrupt this whole situation and uh, yeah, but the economy. I will, really you know, the reason why we entered. Yes, sir, mm. But the, it, it shouldn't be a dialogue. Yeah. <laughs> she will it, answer your It is a good point, but I will tell you that the reason why we entered um, the financial crisis. It's a very big discussion. And also I understand that there are some perceptions about the Greek people. Uh, not all Greek people tax evade. Also people believe that Greeks are lazy. I can assure you that Greek people work and if you see statistics, they work a lot, even sometimes more than uh, some European people that we believe they work a lot. And uh, yes, there have been faults of Greek people about uh, this situation. But again, it is a very big discussion. What I would focus is the fact that this type of economic crisis affected people a lot in ways that it didn't in the past. Because in the past, generally, even in uh, times that there was not financial crisis, average people did not enjoy the economic opportunities and capabilities that people enjoyed in the 80s and the 90s. Generally, I mean, today modern people have access uh, into facilities and opportunities that in the past they didn't. So in the 19th century, it wasn't common for people to educate, travel, make tourism. But in the 80s and the 90s, everyone could enter a university, travel, enjoy life. So all this breakage of this uh, economic evolution and evolution of the lifestyle, if you want, brought uh, people to despair in conjunction with serious uh, institutional problems in the justice system, in the education system. Greek people don't suffer just because of the economic. Economic situation is a symptom of the whole pathogeny. So we have to see this clearly and, under and understand that this financial crisis, uh, as I say, along with other problems, bring uh, Greeks into a situation that um, is very, very difficult, very difficult for their economic survival, but also for the cultural survival in the sense that they cannot live their life and their lifestyle as they used to. Now, the second uh, thing about the education, in the Palestinian situation, you have radicalization, indoctrination, um, hate, as you say, it has been documented uh, as, a, as a strategy. Of course, we cannot see a thing like that in Greeks. And I could never say that the educational system promotes violence. But I would say that culturally, Greeks do have an element of disobedience that comes, if you want, for me, it's a cultural assumption of the 400 years against uh, that was the Turkish occupation and the sense to show disobedience against the ruler. But um, this is not connected, I think, to this phenomenon. It's not connected to extremism. It's just a pride of not having a ruler over your head, which for me is a good thing, by the way. <laughs> a personal opinion. Uh, we have uh, room for one, two short questions, so please, sir, and you. Uh, the, the, the gentleman with If I may add a small, small comment on Just that, for example, if you see the Velvedo robbers, which are not classified as terrorists because the court decided that they were not terrorists, but uh, it did uh, convict them for their robberies, they say that we did our robberies for disobedience and actually as a way to, uh, to confront the system. And you can see how this extremist ideology is passing through the channels of common criminality. So there is a cultural element, indeed, but uh, it is hard to pinpoint it. Thank you, Maria, please. Okay, thank you. Um, given the international cri current financial crisis that's developing, um, do you think that we will see the international repercussions on the same level as happened in Greece around the world? That's part of, that's 
part of the question. The second part relates to the refugee crisis. Most countries in Northern Europe are now turning back refugees as such, or enforcing measures to stop them coming in, and the population as such is rising against that phenomena of the refugees coming into the country, and the country is unable to deal with it as such from an economic level. Do you think there will be terrorism of a, of a, of a similar nature developing in these countries? Um, first of all, I have to tell you that, you know, Europol spoke about the triangle of this kind of terror that we face in Greece, um, showing uh, the countries of, of course, Greece, Spain and Italy. And um, when I talk with uh, law enforcement officials abroad, uh, they speak about the Greek model in the sense that this financial situation has brought this kind of model of extremism that, of course, could be exported. But as I said, it doesn't adhere only to the economic situation, so it needs also other reasons. Um, when I was making a similar presentation to uh, law enforcement that was from um, Austria, there was this Austrian uh, gentleman who said to me, okay, so if you have such a complaint, why don't you follow this, this, this route? And he was mentioning me all the institutional capabilities that an Austrian has in order to uh, counter um, certain problems in his country. And I said to him, do you believe that if this existed in Greece, we would have this conversation and this topic of lecture now? Mm -hmm. So uh, what happens to Greece is a model. This is why uh, extremist experts speak about the Greek model. This is why Europol speaks about the triangle, and it seems like there is a fusion to Greece and Spain and also what we call extremism or terrorism tourism, because there is an exchange in these countries of people who go there, protest, perpetrate violence, people who return, who come from one country to another. But uh, is it my esti estimation that this could be spread? I don't think if the um, background is not the same. I could not see this kind of violence taking place, for example, in Switzerland, because the situation is different, because uh, citizens have different uh, ways to mobilize themselves. This doesn't mean that I give credit to extremis extremists and say that there is no other way. I believe that there is always another way. But sometimes it's a bit harder to find it. Not all people have the patience. And um, also some institutional difficulties are taken advantage in the rhetoric by those uh, extremists, so they pose uh, extreme violence as the only way. But to answer shortly to your question, unless you have the same uh, elements, you don't have the same uh, cocktail. And we have room for another question, for the last question. First, thank you for a very interesting talk. Mike, I'm curious, did you pay any specific attention to participation of women or feminist group in this, the same way it did in Israel? Did, did women in Greece pay, pay, uh, invest any energy in these, uh, in these violent uh, groups or they were sidelines? Thank you. Uh, a very nice question and I always have a gender perspective. So yes, I did uh, have a look on it and we did have and we do have uh, female participation. Uh, what is of course quite interesting and it is common also in other types of um, terrorism and organization, is that usually women who participate in such groups participate because they have either a relative or an emotional partner already in the group. So this was uh, something that um, was very interesting uh, to me because it seems like it follows the same pattern. This has to do generally with the way women socialize and the way that they participate in groups. Um, and I have to tell you that um, Members that have been considered, members arrested and accused of extremist and terrorist violence that have been considered very hard by law enforcement have been women. So uh, yes, we do see the participation. Of course, in, in numbers, it's smaller than the men. Um, we have had a case where quite prominent uh, with the arrest of a young lady that has been considered uh, to have actually uh, been the logistical support and uh, 
organizing the whole details uh, of the attacks. And it's just a young, uh, young woman. But what I said, which is very interesting uh, to me, I don't know if it's uh, for you, is that usually women do not participate just because they had this idea and they entered the group, but usually there is a liaison, someone in the family or very often an emotion, uh, a partner, a, a boyfriend or, uh, you know, a spouse, not spouse, usually these people don't enter into very conventional family relationships, but I think you understand. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if allow me, to, allow me to, to thank. First, I would like to thank the audience for your lively participation and the relevance of the question. It was a real nice debate. Uh, we could have gone on and on, but it was a really uh, nice uh, time of debate. And of course, if there was a nice debate, it's because we had a wonderful lecture. And thank you again, Maria, uh, for uh, this uh, wide, uh, wide expressing uh, idea of terrorism, of violence uh, in many sides that we sometimes tend to forget that there are, there's not one, one side of violence. And uh, for uh, your answers to the questions also. Thank you for all. I would like to thank you for the, not only for the invitation, for the participation. And I would like to say something not to make a good comment, but from my heart. Uh, Israeli audience is always the most clever audience because you are clever people. Your questions were not easy. Uh, and this makes uh, this presentation very important for me because you gave me food for thought. Thank you.